What's up guys, I'm Ira Shell, and this is Nuggets of Truth. We've talked a lot about the divinity of Jesus. Nevertheless, people still find excuses and reasons not to believe that Jesus is God. So here's five statements that clearly declare the divinity of Jesus, the Son of God. Let's start at the beginning because Jesus, according to scripture, was with God before the beginning. The beginning started with the creation of heaven. That was the very first thing God created, Genesis chapter 1, 1. Now, according to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 through 25, God created all things by himself alone with the help of no one else. This would seem to completely denounce and disprove any idea of a trinity actually being biblical unless we understand what God is. Being the mortals that we are with the limitations that we have, it's truly impossible in this restricted and ignorant form to fully grasp all that God is. But what we can grasp is that God is much more than just a person. God is like an office, an organization. He's like a conglomerate made up of three separate all-powerful beings or persons with one sole purpose desire and heart that makes up the checks and balances of the conglomerate we call god we know this from the very first statement mentioning god genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth the very first time we see the word god it's not singular it's the plural hebrew word for god elohim which is translated throughout scripture as gods such as Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 you shall have no other gods Elohim before me Deuteronomy 10 17 for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of Lords the great the mighty and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe Psalms 82 verse 1 God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment there are many more mentions of gods using the same word Elohim throughout scripture. For more on the gods, check out our video series entitled The Gods, which is under our the 2D category. Now, if God isn't a conglomerate made up of three persons, then why would God use the term Elohim, a plural term, in order to describe one singular person? And if you think that this is just a mistake, you're telling me you'd rather believe that God made a mistake every single time he mentions himself in Genesis chapter 1 and throughout scripture than believe that God is made up of more than one person. God himself even clarifies by saying that God isn't just one person in the creation story recorded in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Who is the us? God says he made man in his own image, yet God said, let us make man in our image. This is a direct contradiction within the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, which would deem it not only inaccurate, but completely and totally ridiculous to believe if God is only one person. Therefore, there has to be an explanation. The explanation is simple. God is not one singular person, but a conglomerate of three separate all-powerful beings or persons that balance each other out in the perfect trinity. Three members, Father, Son, and Spirit. We can see this clearly when we read the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross.
Paul is explaining the God nature of Jesus. He says that Jesus isn't just the image of the invisible God, but that all things were created through him and for him. Now, some will say, but Paul says that he's the firstborn of all creation, so he had to be created. No, that's a completely wrong and ignorant interpretation of what Paul just said, because now you've just caused scripture to contradict itself. All things can't be created through him and for him if he was the first thing that was created. That's a direct contradiction. Paul clarifies the statement that he makes when he says that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might be preeminent, or as Hebrews puts it in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, the forerunner. For more on Jesus being the beginning of God's creation, check out our video, Is Jesus the Beginning of God's Creation, which is under our Nuggets of Truth category. Let's just read one more verse that confirms that all creation, both unseen and seen, were created by Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The author of the book of Hebrews not only said that God created all things through Jesus, but that Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God, and it is Jesus that upholds the universe by the word of his power. If Jesus isn't God, then the entire New Testament is blasphemy and contradicting, and we should just throw it all out. But I know for a fact that there are still some who have such a spirit of Antichrist, a spirit that denies that Jesus is the Christ, his divine nature, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, that none of this will compel them to believe. But real quick, because I know there's always those that will say, Antichrist is a person, not just a spirit. Check out our video, The Antichrist, which is under our The End Times category for why that statement is inherently wrong and it's adding to scripture. So with that said, let's lay more evidence on the table for our doubters. Jesus is the Lamb of God, according to John chapter 1 verse 29 and Acts chapter 8 verse 32 through 35. Look at the two names given to Jesus, the Lamb of God, in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. This isn't the only time either. Jesus is also the Word of God, according to John chapter 1. For more on Jesus being the Word of God, check out our video, What or Who is the Word of God, which is under our Nuggets of Truth category. Now let's look at how John describes the Word of God, Jesus. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13 through 16. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The two names I want you to notice are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How can a man or other being, not God, be above God who is King and Lord? Let's just start with the second name first, Lord of Lords, and let's establish that God is Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the almighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. Psalms 136 verse 1 through 3, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now some will say that doesn't prove anything because those verses are in Hebrew and the verses talking about Jesus are in Greek. Therefore, you can't prove that it's the same kind of lordship. Okay. 
Fair enough. Did you know that every time the Lord is mentioned in the New Testament, it's the same Greek word, karios, which means Lord. It's used for the proper name of God, which we have translated as Yahweh, like in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, which is Jesus quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, as well as the other Hebrew word for Lord, also translated as Master, which is Adon, such as Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verse 44, quoting David in Psalms 110, verse 1. So yes, these verses can in fact be used to prove that Jesus is either God or the New Testament is blasphemy directly contradicting the Old Testament by elevating the name of Jesus and elevating the Lordship of Jesus, a mere man or lesser being, above the Almighty God. Now, for the first name, King of Kings, again let's establish that God is King. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 7 and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Did you notice what God said? He was rejected by the people as being king over them. God can't be rejected as king if he wasn't king to begin with. Here's another verse for you. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Did you catch that? How can God be the king of Israel, but Jesus be the king of kings? Unless Jesus is God, it's impossible. Again, it would be blasphemy. Now, I want you to also notice that the Lord says that he is the first and the last. This isn't the only time either. He says the same sentiment in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12. In fact, he adds to this in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Lord God says that not only is he the first and the last, but he is also the Alpha and the Omega. In fact, in Revelation 21 verse 5 through 7, he adds that he is the beginning and the end. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Here's the situation though. These three claims Jesus makes about himself in the book of Revelation as well. But the difference is, he does it in one sentence. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 through 13. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Again, this is a direct contradiction in scripture and blasphemy on Jesus' part if Jesus is not God. Here's the last point I wanna make. Jesus claims to be the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Now many will ask, okay, so how is this a problem? Well, let's bring to remembrance one of the first verses we learn as a beginner in the faith. Psalms 23 verse one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David tells us that the Lord is our shepherd, but Jesus tells us that he not only is our shepherd and the only shepherd, the one shepherd, but that he is the good shepherd. If Jesus makes the claim that he is the good shepherd, 
he must be differentiating himself from other shepherds. We see this in the prophecies of both Zechariah and Jeremiah. Zechariah 11 verse 17, Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered, his right eye utterly blinded. Jeremiah 23 verse 1, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. So this now begs the question, is Jesus saying that God is a worthless shepherd? Or that he is somehow a better shepherd than God? Or that he is replacing God as shepherd? Of course not. Jesus is simply claiming the title given to him by his ancestor David so that we might understand that the Lord thy God is one. And just for a little extra food for thought, look at what Jesus said about his and David's relationship when the Pharisees came to question him. Matthew chapter 22, verse 41 through 46. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Pharisees were unable to answer Jesus because they read and understood the scriptures with blinded and veiled eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 12 through 18 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3 through 4. They didn't and they couldn't grasp that the Christ Jesus was God in the flesh dwelling among them, which is why his name is Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23, God with us. So Jesus being in the very nature an image of God set off his godliness to take on flesh. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 through 11. The flesh he took on was the descendant of David, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 through 17, so that God could fulfill his promise to David recorded in Psalms 89, 35 through 37, and spoken of again in Acts chapter 2 verse 29 through 31. So while you guys think about all of that, let's sum everything up real quick. God is not a singular person, but instead a conglomerate of three separate all-powerful beings or persons of one mind, purpose, and desire. We, the church, have named this the Trinity, and the Trinity is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is why we can boldly and confidently proclaim that Jesus is God without any hesitation or reservation. He is the very nature of God. He is the creator. All things were created through him and for him. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life and picks it up again as he wills. He is the root of David, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, and Revelation 22, verse 16, because he is the creator God who is from before the beginning, but he is also the descendant of David because he set aside his godhood in order to take on flesh and save the entire world. That is why Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. It is at his name and his name alone that every knee in heaven on earth and under the earth will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 through 11 as prophesied by the Lord God himself through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 45 verse 23. Therefore we can say with confidence and without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did please feel free to like, comment, share and subscribe to our channel and until next time God bless.